Hello, it's Keith here, and this is lesson 20 of my platform specific series of 68,000 assembly programming tutorials. Now, last week we wrote some code that ran on the Neo Geo. Now, quite surprisingly, we can actually also run it on the Genesis. You see, the Genesis sound chip is more advanced than the Neo Geo one, but it's actually backwards compatible. So while the Neo Geo only has four sound channels, the Genesis actually has six. But because the Genesis has more channels, the Neo Geo code will actually work on the Genesis. And because the Z80 on the Genesis also runs the sound, we can use the Neo Geo code almost as is, just with a slight tweak, and that will allow us to make that same code running on the Genesis. Now that said, we do have to use different code to actually get the data to the Genesis Z80 chip and also to start the Z80 chip. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. So effectively, we're going to be converting last week's code to make it run on the Genesis. That said, well, you don't need to use the Z80 at all on the Genesis, and for such a simple sound sample, really, you're probably just better off using the 68000 directly. So that's a big improvement on the Genesis over the Neo Geo. But the point of today's lesson is really to learn how to send data to the Z80, how to get the Z80 started, and that's what we're going to be doing today. Now, the Z80 has the full 64K address range. There is only 8K of memory, though. You can see that the rest is used by other things. Rather surprisingly, the sound chip on the Z80 is actually memory mapped, which is a common trick on the 6502 and the 68000, but usually Z80s use the ports and the out and in command, but in this case they actually don't, it's memory mapped registers. You can see we've got a variety of registers here, and these are the ones we're going to be using to control the sound. We're going to have a look at the YM2612 in more detail next time when we use the 68000. So for this time, please watch this episode. And then if you want to see more about how the Z80 code actually works, please go and watch the last episode, which primarily covered the Neo Geo. But as I say, the code is basically the same. Now, when it comes to accessing it from the 68000 side, it's very straightforward. The Z80 address space is mapped within the range here, A0 quadruple zero to A0 quadruple F. It's the same range. Now, the only thing is we do need to turn off the Z80 before we can write to this address space from the 68000 side. And that's really what we're going to be learning how to do today. Turn off the Z80, transfer our program code, and then turn the Z80 on and start the Z80 so that it can run that code. So let's actually hear Chibi Sound running on the Genesis with the FM sound chip of the Z80. So Chibi Sound uses a single byte. The top bit defines if noise is enabled. The next bit defines if the volume's high or low. And the rest of the bits define the pitch, as you can hear here. And now we're using the LFO effect to distort the sound. So it's a very simple example. It was really designed for Grime Z80 and Grime 68000. It just creates simple beeps for a very basic beginner game. But that's what we're going to be learning how to make work today. So Here's the Chibi Sound code. The function Chibi Sound will take a byte from D0 and make the respective tone. And it's this initialization routine which we need by the Z80 Genesis to actually get the sound driver ready within the Z80 sound memory range. Now, the Z80 code itself here, you can see it. Now, this is basically almost exactly the same Neo Geo version. The only difference is this red write function here has been altered because we need to write to different addresses and we're writing the register number we want to change to hexadecimal 4000 in the Z80 range. And then the new value, that should be a V, not a B. That's the new value to hexadecimal 4001. And we just need to wait each time to check that the FM chip is not busy. And we do that by reading in from hexadecimal 4000 and checking if bit seven is zero or not. So everything here is basically the same as the Neo Geo version. It's this routine here that we're going to really be looking at today. So our procedure for the Z80 is simple. We want to turn the Z80 off, transfer the program code, the code you just saw, which is compiled as a binary file, and that's included just here. So what we want to do is first we want to turn off the Z80 processor, then we want to transfer the binary file, which is the code which will run on the Z80, and that's included just here. We have to compile that as a separate Z80 file, so we're loading that in there. So we transfer that to the Z80, we then reset the Z80, so the Z80 will effectively boot up and then it will be ready to receive our sounds, and then we send the sounds to the Z80. Now, when it comes to communicating with the Z80, we only have this address space. We don't have any kind of ports, unlike the Neo Geo, where we had a single port to communicate. So we will have to do it all with the memory range here, and that's what we're going to be doing. So what do we do? 
Well, first of all, we need to request the bus from the Z80. This allows us to write to the memory range. And so the way we do this is we write the word hexadecimal 100 to A11100 here. And then we are going to reset the Z80 as well. So we write hexadecimal 100 to A11200 here. Then what we need to do is we need to wait for the Z80 to be ready. And what we do here, we've got a function to do this for us. You can see it just here. And what we're doing is we're reading in a word from the same address, A11100 here. And we're testing bit 8. And when that becomes 0, the bus is now ready for us to write to it. And that's what we're going to need to do. So at this point, we're able to start writing. That's exactly what we do. We write to A0 quadruple 0 here, which is the start of the Z80 range. So effectively, we're going to start from here. And we're going to write our sound driver into something resembling this range here. It's not a very big sound driver, so it certainly won't use it all. So here's the source of our sound driver. You can see it just here. We're calculating the length of our sound driver. And then we're just copying the bytes to effectively directly to the Z80 here, because the Z80 range, once we've run these commands, is mapped into this range here. OK, so at this point, the Z80 code is now within the Z80 chip. We now need to release the bus, and we need to restart the Z80. So we write a zero word to A11100. I write a zero word to A11200, that's the reset bus. And then we need to issue the reset command. And we do that by writing hexadecimal 100 to A11200. And that in initializes the reset. OK. At this point, the Z80 will start up. And there's a bit of test code I've put into the Z80 code here, which we'll have a look at in just a moment. But we're effectively writing hexadecimal 69 to 1F80 and 1F81 here. So we can test that the Z80 really started up just by dumping that memory address. And that's what we're doing just here. So this is initializing. And that's effectively loading our Z80 ROM. But if we want to check if that ROM was really running or not, we can dump the 1F80 range and just see that on the screen. And if that has a 6969 in it, we know that our ROM at least started up now. If there's a bug in our ROM, if the sound processing code is faulty, maybe it'll crash. But at least we can test that. And you can see here there is indeed a 6969 here. Now, I'll just give you a very simple example here. If I put a halt in here, and then I compile that with my Z80 code here, and now I run be sound again, we got no sound and we got no 6969 here because I effectively forced the Z80 to crash there. So that was an early test that I did in the code when I was struggling to check if the Z80 was really starting up correctly or not. So that's a very easy way you can test the Z80. But once we've run this routine, the Z80 is now running independently on its own. And so the last thing we need to do is need to actually transfer data to Chibi Sound so that the Chibi Sound driver now running on the Z80 knows what sound to play. So how do we do that? Well, we use the bus request again, but this time we don't want to be resetting the Z80 because we want the Z80 to keep running. We, we could, I suppose, but it, you know, for a more advanced example, you certainly wouldn't want it to. But all we need to do is write that hexadecimal 100 to A11100 again. We're running our wait command again because we need to wait for the bus to be available. And then we are writing a byte to a defined location. So we're using 1F00 here as the defined memory location within the Z80 range, which of course becomes 1F00 within the Z80 16-bit range. And that's the byte that is sort of being shared between the two. And that's how the 68000 tells the Z80 what we want it to do. So we're writing the byte that we're passed to Chibi Sound to 1F00. And then we're writing a command byte, which is just anything non-zero to 1F01. And what Chibi Sound on the Z80 is going to do is it's going to read that, and it's going to wait until that byte becomes non-zero, process the command, and then set it back to zero so that it can be ready for the next command to be sent. Once we've written these two bytes, we then just turn off our bus request by writing the zeros again. So effectively, just the same command as we had here. But we, we aren't resetting this time, so that's all there is to it. And so this is how we can take control of the Z80 bus, put a byte or two there, and then give control back to the Z80, which will continue the Z80 code where it was. So that's how we do the 68000 side. And the remaining work is on the Z80 side. 
So we've got a, a very simple initialization routine here. I basically copied this off the um, Sega Master System code. So we're just starting with a whole bunch of um, C9s here with just a jump command at the very start of the ROM because this is the address that's going to be executed first by the Z80. So in case any interrupts fire, we're just ignoring them here. We're starting our code here, disabling interrupts, setting interrupt mode 1, loading the stat pointer to hexadecimal 2000. Now, if you remember, hexadecimal 2000 is the top of the memory range, so our stack will be around here. That's the first byte we can use there. As I said before, this is our test code. This is just a marker to show that the, car, that the ROM data actually loaded OK. And then we're going to wait for a command. So this is our main loop. This is what is waiting for the commands from the 68000 and then passing them to Chibi Sound, which is the Z80 code, which is essentially the same as the Neo Geo code we looked at last time. So we read in bytes from 1F01, wait for one to not be zero, and when we get one that's not zero, we read in from 1F00 and we call chibi sound. At that point, we've processed the command, and so all we do is we cancel the command by writing a zero to 1F01 so that the loop will then wait back here again. And as I said before, the chibi sound code is basically the same as last time, so we're not going to cover it today. So there we go. As I say, if you want to learn about how to control the sound chip from the Z80, please see the Neo Geo lesson last time. I'm not going to cover the exact same code again. We are going to look at the 68000 side, because unlike the Neo Geo, the Genesis doesn't need the Z80 to make sound with the FM chip. So we're going to look at the registers and the 68000 side next time. So if you prefer, please stick around for that. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting. Thanks for watching today, and goodbye. If you enjoyed today's lesson, please check out my website. We've got tutorials, source code, and development tools for 6502, 68000, and Z80 systems, and a lot more systems coming in the future. We're going to be covering the 8086 and the ARM and a few other things as well going forward. And if you've liked this lesson, if you've got questions, comments, or suggestions on how it could be made better, please consider signing up to my forum. It's free, of course, and you can come along here and you can make suggestions, you can ask questions. And if you've got assembly projects you're working on, please let us know what they are. Maybe show off a few screenshots, tell us what things you've found interesting or what tricks you've come up with, because we'd love to know about it. Anyway, thanks for watching today and goodbye.